Welcome to Friday Night Games. I'm Jay Comics, and tonight we're talking about pinball. And not just any pinball bitch. We're talking about pinball on the Nintendo Entertainment System. You're likely already familiar with at least one of Nintendo's many pinball offerings. Pokemon Pinball, Kirby's Pinball Land, Metroid Prime Pinball... Probably not Galactic Pinball for Virtual Boy. But we wouldn't have any of these games were it not for one of Nintendo's most legendary figures, the beloved programming guru and president of Nintendo, Satoru Iwata. But before we get into all of that, since we're talking about pinball, I'm gonna need some help. Shit. Jackie boy. Hello. God. Oh. My. God. What? Pinball, huh? I don't know. I'm pretty busy. Alright, fine. I'll be over in a minute. So, you want to talk about pinball? Well, you've come to the right place because, guess what? I love pinball. I may not be an expert or know everything about them, but my history with pinball machines goes way back. Pokemon pinball is my jam. And I even personally own two kick-ass machines. So sit back and relax, because tonight, Josh and I will be your guides as we journey through the history, development, and legacy of the oft-overlooked, yet extremely iconic pinball, and its influential creator, Satoru Iwata. When you look back at Nintendo's earliest output on its roaringly successful home console, the Famicom, you'll notice just how much variety there was. Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Popeye were must-have conversions of Nintendo's most popular arcade games, while Mario Bros. allowed for competitive multiplayer. Mahjong and Gomoku Narabe Renju appealed to an older crowd, while baseball and tennis offered innovative and fun sports titles for even more variety. And it even had Donkey Kong Jr. math. Nintendo's next game would offer even more variety to the lineup by bringing one of the most classic game experiences to their system. By the time the Famicom hit store shelves in the early 80s, pinball machines had been almost completely eclipsed by video games. But before electronic games crashed onto the scene, pinball was the undisputed king of arcades. Dazzling lights and the sound of a thousand shiny metal balls bouncing off bumpers and racking up thousands of points filled the halls of amusement parks and popular hangout spots. Innovations on the classic pinball experience had been gradually increasing ever since modern pinball was introduced all the way back in the early 1900s. But before we dive even further into pinball's history, if you haven't checked out my prior videos, I highly recommend you check those videos out to get caught up first. Link will be in the description down below. The tradition of people gathering in large groups for spectacle and entertainment is nearly as old as humanity itself. The penny arcades that cropped up in the late 19th and early 20th century are a natural extension to this time-honored tradition. Spurred on by new technology after the Industrial Revolution and easier access to electricity, new coin-operated attractions and novelties started springing up. After America's Great Depression in the early 30s, fortune tellers, slot machines, and love testers began growing in popularity since they gave people simple entertainment for only a penny. One of the most popular coin-op attractions was a tabletop version of an old skee-ball type game called Bagatelle. 
These portable bagatelles had a board with strategically placed holes surrounded by pins which acted as obstacles. Thus, they were nicknamed pin games. And because of their simplicity and accessibility, their popularity grew. The popularity of pin games also bred competition and innovation. Flippers were added to increase the fun, and flashing lights and sound attracted even more customers. Eventually, this all culminated in the pinball tables we're more familiar with today. Pinball was especially popular among street youths and hooligans. With machines showing up anywhere, young people would gather. And just like with comic books and video games and television and everything that's awesome and fun, a moral panic followed. And parents and politicians and priests alike saw groups of teenagers at parlors all huddled around pinball machines and it, oh, and it struck fear into their hearts. Before you knew it, pinball was the harbinger of society's downfall, the boogeyman that would end common decency. And then these, and then these fascists rounded up these glorious machines and destroyed them and burned them and smashed them in. You gotta be kidding me! The negative reaction was so strong that in some places pinball was banned all the way up until the 70s. Luckily, pinball's popularity weathered the storms of controversy and manufacturers continued innovating as technology expanded. After microprocessors became more widely available, pinball machines were quick to adopt circuit boards and digital displays, making even more exciting experiences. However, this was a double-edged sword as microprocessors also paved the way for pinball's greatest competition, video games. <laughs> Arcade games like Space Invaders and Pong exploded in popularity, nearly eclipsing pinball in the cultural zeitgeist. Video games captured the imagination of kids, teens, and adults alike, and arcade owners quickly began replacing their old pinball machines with the high-tech and futuristic video games. But even as the rise of video games struck a devastating blow to the pinball industry, so strong was pinball's influence that it was never fully snuffed out. In fact, video games were eager to adopt the fun and excitement of pinball into their electronic simulations. TV Pinball by Exidy was released in 1974, long before the video game boom of the early 80s and stands out as an extremely primitive version of pinball. A few years later, Namco, the people who made Pac-Man, released multiple pinball simulations to arcades, like Bombi and QDQ. Naturally, Atari would also join the fray with Video Pinball on their massively successful Atari 2600. Even home computers couldn't stay away from the influence of pinball. The Apple II, one of the most popular home computers of the 80s, released the incredibly innovative games Raster Blaster and David's Midnight Magic in 1982. But that's not to say that classic pinball machines just sat around gathering dust. On the contrary, while video games were trying to simulate pinball, physical machines were growing more and more elaborate, providing experiences that were impossible to recreate in a video game of the time. Sure, the Atari 2600 could offer you a pinball-like experience at home, but if you wanted to play cutting-edge pinball machines, nothing could compare to the tactile feeling of a real-ass machine. The video game crash of 1983 in America also helped bring video games down a peg and allowed some manufacturers to refocus their efforts back into physical pinball machines. So it comes as no surprise that in 1984, hot off the heels of the Famicom's launch, and searching for new games to add to the console, Nintendo would turn to the well-trodden path of pinball. This wasn't the first time Nintendo had drawn from pinball's popularity. Only a few months prior to pinball's release on the Nintendo Famicom, another game by the name of Pinball was released on Nintendo's successful line of Game & Watches. It's entirely possible that both of these games were in development at the same time and intended to promote each other. Jackie Boy and I talked all about Game & Watch Pinball in our multi-screen series video, but since then... I've been able to get my hands on a physical copy! You what?! Give me that! I want to see! You keep your crab claws off it, bitch! I'll show you! This is really, really schwazzy little shiny machine. Ignore the little... I mean, it's scratched up a little bit. The black and gold, like I said, it looks very... How do you say? When you open it up, you know, you can, you can tell its age. 
by the yellowing white plastic classic Nintendo. <laughs> but just just the stickers, the sides, you know, you couldn't tell in our last playthrough because it was an emulator, right? But here you can see the side panels, you know, they're metallic. They shine, really catch your eye. The screen looks great. It works perfectly. The little robot is there. This is a definitely a worthwhile addition to my pinball collection. Like I said, I've got a couple of physical machines myself, but this, you know, goes very nicely with them. It's even the same color scheme as the Lord of the Rings machine and everything. In addition to Game & Watch Pinball and Pinball for the Famicom and NES, Nintendo also released Versus Pinball later that same year for the arcade Versus system. But knowing Nintendo's history with pinball is only half the story. The other half is the story of the late, great Satoru Iwata. Throughout Friday Night Games, we've talked about many of Nintendo's founding fathers. Hiroshi Yamauchi, under whose leadership Nintendo entered the video game marketplace. Gunpei Yokoi, who helmed the creation of Nintendo's Game & Watch. Masayuki Uemura, inventor of the Famicom. And of course, Shigeru Miyamoto, creator of Nintendo's most iconic characters, and the man who brought an artist's perspective to what video games could be. And the list goes on. But no discussion about important figures in Nintendo would be complete without mentioning Satoru Iwata. From humble programmer to president of Nintendo, Iwata's influence cannot be overstated. Iwata began his programming journey in high school after having saved up enough money to buy an HP 65, the first ever programmable calculator. Without access to the internet or even a computer magazine, Iwata was largely self-taught through trial and error. His passion for game development was ignited when he began sharing his calculator creations with one of his school friends who eagerly played each one of Iwata's games. As Iwata entered his college years, a computer department store opened up nearby and he began visiting every weekend, eager to share his passion for programming with other computer enthusiasts. This was a time when personal computers were still extremely expensive, and Iwata made the bold choice to deplete all of his savings and take on a loan in order to buy a personal home computer. As fate would have it, his computer of choice was a relatively niche option in Japan, the Commodore PET, which used the same 6502 microprocessor as the Famicom. During Iwata's third year of college, the store manager approached him with a part-time job offer. Bringing together the store's enthusiasts and employees, Iwata's manager formed his own company, HAL Laboratory, cheekily named because H-A-L are the three letters preceding IBM. Through his work with HAL Laboratory and his college studies, Iwata continued owning his skills, and after graduating, he joined HAL full-time. Iwata was immediately enamored with the Famicom upon its launch in Japan, and he wanted a crack at programming for it. As luck would have it, a friend of HAL Laboratories was able to hook Iwata up with a meeting at Nintendo. And before he knew it, Iwata was working on his first project for the Famicom. Pinball! So how's that? Honestly, I could keep going. I have a lot of- No! No. That's enough. Alright, let's just- Let's just check out the manual. BE A PINBALL WIZARD! Holy sh**! JESUS! I'm ready. That's just what the manual says, alright? Calm down. Give me that! Let's just look at the rules. Okay, here they are. Oh. oh my god. <laughs> we know how to play pinball. It's pinball. Yeah. It's, not, it's not gonna be hard. Look at this shit! You got sea lions, penguins, playing cards, slot machines, bumpers, Pac-Man pellets, little birds, this is crazy! And look at this blue! That's a good blue! Well, the first thing you notice about Iwata's pinball is the game board is made using two different screens, and the ball rolls seamlessly between the two. It takes some getting used to, but you can get the hang of it pretty quickly. Each screen also has its own set of bumpers, which makes the upper and lower sections seem almost like their own little zones. Like with any pinball game, you'll start off by shooting the ball into the playing field and smashing it around just to see what happens. 
Eventually, you'll catch on to patterns and figure out what everything does. If you hatch all three eggs at the same time, yellow stoppers will appear to keep your ball from falling down the holes on the sides. Or if you collect all the pellets in this area, the sea lions will activate and do a little celebration dance. And earn you a bunch of points! And in pinball, all you have is points. And glory. Hitting the ball up here will activate the slot machine. In order to stop the slots, you have to hit the moving platform, and if you line up three sevens in a row, the entire screen will turn pink. One of my favorite things about this version of pinball is when you hit the ball into this hole right here, it's a secret room with a Mario minigame! <gasps> I knew it! Pinball was a Mario game the whole time! It's Ken! Not this game! How can this be canon? Tell me, where is this supposed to take place, huh? You dog mushing your kingdom! Listen! Can't you just shut up and be civil while I've got company uh, over? Uh, 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 you tell me! You're the bohemian here! What company? No, not I'm not talking to you, Bean. I'm talking to the demon potato! You know what? Forget it. Let's just move on. Aside from the original arcade game Donkey Kong, Pinball is one of the few appearances of Pauline. Even though it's a small cameo and she's relegated to a damsel in distress again, it's really cool to see Mario's first flame get another outing. Peach hadn't been invented yet, so Pauline, referred to here as Lady, same as in Donkey Kong, is still Mario's girlfriend. This is also the game that established her having brown hair, where it was previously orange. In this minigame, you control Mario at the bottom of the screen. You use the little platform he's carrying above his head to bounce the pinball into the number lamps. They'll change colors when you hit him, and if you can match all of the colors in a line, it will decrease the size of the platforms Pauline is walking on. Eventually, the platforms will become so small that Pauline will fall down, and you have to catch her and guide her safely off screen. Successfully saving Pauline will net you 10,000 points, and the minigame will reset. But be careful, because if you accidentally drop Pauline, or she walks off the platform, you won't just get kicked off of the minigame. You'll lose a life, okay? And you only get three in this game. And if it's your last life, you're f***ed! You're f***ed! If it's your last life, you're f***ed! But thankfully, by collecting 30,000 points, you can earn an extra life. This little minigame is probably the most unique aspect of pinball. Mario's inclusion here is no doubt the result of Miyamoto's tireless campaign to try and include his chubby little creation in any game he possibly could. It's a fun addition to Nintendo's pinball that makes this version of the game worth checking out, especially if you're a Mario fan. Speaking of Mario, these blue penguins, they look very familiar. Is this the first appearance of any blue penguins in any Mario game? Is it? Now, I played a lot of single player when capturing footage, so believe me when I say F this horse ass piece of sh game! The ball constantly goes flying directly into the hole and there's not a goddamn thing you can do to stop it. It is such undeniable bullshit. The ball can be bouncing around, racking up loads of points when then suddenly, F you! Oh, I'm sorry, were you trying to get a royal flush? Why don't you eat a dick instead? This sh is impossible! It's literally like trying to win the f lottery! If you even think about getting four cards in a row, the game goes out of its way to stare you directly in the eyes as the ball does some JFK assassination magic bullshit and slam dunks you straight into the gutter! Look at this! Are you kidding me? What could I fucking do? The ball's just like, bye, bitch! At first I was loving the game. I was like, oh wow, you wanna really hit this one out of the park. Look at all the things you can do. But after an hour of this luck-based garbage, I wanna go back in time and slap him in the fucking face! Jesus Christ, Jackie boy. You calm down. You're gonna give yourself an aneurysm. Iwata is a treasure. Now if I could just get the ball in here and trigger the mini game, I just need to Shit. You know what? F pinball! This game can eat my ass! This is horse! Shit. I want to bring back Iwata back to life, just so I can tell, <laughs> just so I can tell him to go f himself. F pinball, ban it, send it all to hell. <gasps> oh, 
Oh my god! I got it! The royal flush! Oh my god, what is happening? This is amazing! Everything is golden now! It's like the long lost city of El Dorado. There's a bumper at the bottom to keep your ball from falling down. <laughs> Forgive us, Iwata-san. I can't believe we ever doubted you. That was incredible. What a roller coaster of emotions. But isn't that just the way it is with real pinball? Sometimes it's some bull, a f***ing ass, shit, and other times you get a sick multi-ball and it gives you an unparalleled rush, the likes of which you've never felt. Next, we're going to take a look at the Arcade Versus System version, Versus Pinball. If you want to know more about the Versus System, check out my last episode on Versus Tennis. During the early 80s, Nintendo was releasing two versions for each of its games, a home console version for the Famicom and NES, and a Versus System version for arcades. If you compare the two versions, you'll notice the visuals are much more vibrant in Versus Pinball, and there are a lot more sound effects, and the ball is easier to see, and there's a bunch of other differences, like when you get all the pellets, the ball and the sea lions both turn red, and the screen turns pink, and when you get the ball in this hole, Okay, instead of shooting it back out, it will shoot the ball into the lower zone. And the flippers turn invisible a lot more often. But on the other hand, you can also turn the chickens purple after they're hatched, which activates a ball save mode. When that happens, if your ball falls into this hole, it gets saved by this character. We didn't know who this was at first, but it turns out it's actually Bubbles from Clue Clue Land, which is really fucking cool. I love it when Nintendo games have little cameos and references like these. In the Japanese version, apparently this character is another character called Achilles, with the only other appearance being from Famicom Basic, an obscure, exclusive little Japanese game that- I like Achilles more than Bubbles. Overall, it's a fun pinball game. The arcade version is superior, in my opinion. All of the extra features in the arcade version make it almost worth skipping the NES version altogether. Even so, I've honestly played better electronic pinballs. Look, Pokemon pinball. Oh, but any electronic pinball game doesn't feel the same as a physical machine. It really just makes me want to play a real ass machine. I'm gonna go play some real ass fucking pinball. Wait, what? Oh, yeah, okay, oh! Mil Multi-ball! Ah! 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 Bye, Bean! Thank you for being in my video! After its release in 1984, Pinball sold a respectable amount of cartridges. Between the Famicom and NES, it sold nearly 2 million cartridges, making it the 33rd highest selling game on the system. It was popular enough that when Nintendo introduced the NES to America, Pinball was chosen as one of the launch games. Additionally, it seems to have been either planned for release or fully released for the PC-8801 and Sharp X1 Japanese home computers. I found this advertisement from a Japanese gaming magazine which includes Pinball as one of the several Famicom games coming to the system, yet I can't find any other evidence of the game actually existing. Even bizarre and obscure games like Punchball Mario Bros and Donkey Kong 3 Dai Gyakushu have information and video footage of their existence online. In some cases, you can even find dumps of the original games themselves, but not so with Pinball. I spent hours searching for a copy to play for myself, or even just evidence that it was officially released. And other than that single advertisement, I can't find anything. Even on websites that list all of Nintendo's known Hudson ports, Pinball is conspicuously absent. I kinda started to feel a little bit crazy, and at this point, it kinda seems like it's a case of lost media, so if you can find any information about it, please let me know down in the comments. Despite its modest financial success, Pinball seems to be one of those early NES games that's often overlooked or forgotten about. Don't get me wrong, it definitely has its fans and supporters, but it seems like it's rarely brought up in lists of the greatest NES games and stuff like that. Regardless, Pinball would be the first in a long line of Nintendo-produced pinball games, paving the way for more memorable titles, like the previously mentioned Pokemon Pinball series, Kirby's Pinball Land, Revenge of the Gator, Galactic Pinball, and Mario's Pinball Land. 
Nintendo clearly has a lot of love for this classic little game, and the number of times it's been re-released is a testament to that. The Famicom Disk System, Game Boy Advance e-reader, Wii, and Wii U Virtual Console all got ports, and it was also included as one of the collectible NES games in Animal Crossing on the GameCube. Currently, the Famicom and NES versions are available on Nintendo Switch with an active online subscription, and you can also get Hamster's Arcade Archives version of Versus Pinball through the eShop. As for my personal thoughts on the game, well, I really enjoy both versions. I love the visuals and variety it has to offer, and I especially love the inclusion of Mario and Pauline in the bonus minigame, as well as Bubbles in the arcade version. Sure, it can be very frustrating, but it also has an addictive factor that makes you want to keep trying over and over again. It's far from the first NES game I'd want to play when revisiting these old classics, and of course, it doesn't compare to real pinball, but I would rather play this than, like, Tennis, Urban Champion, or even Clue Clue Land. I can easily see myself revisiting it in the future for a few rounds here or there. Probably not one of the essential must-play NES games, but definitely enjoyable for what it is. As for Satoru Iwata, well, this is only the first we'll be hearing about him. His programming skills and personality would eventually propel him into the role of President of HAL Laboratory, and even more impressively to President of Nintendo itself. His tenure as President is remembered fondly by many Nintendo fans, but sadly it was cut short by his untimely death in 2015 due to medical complications. Yet his legacy lives on through the hearts of his fans and his wonderful games, many of which we'll continue to cover right here on Friday Night Games. Speaking of which, what is the next game? Fall is fast approaching and I think I'm starting to feel a chill in the air. I don't know, maybe it's time I pull out... That game. Well, either way, subscribe because you won't want to miss it and join me next time right here on Friday Night Games. This week's subscriber shoutouts go to... Tails the Me, Chris Cube, E.K. Pennock, and Dovon Mac. Thanks for taking the time to comment on my videos. You guys are awesome.